chapter 19, please. Luke chapter 19, if you would. You might want to grab you a piece of paper and write down what the Holy Spirit, I pray and we pray, will show to us this morning. Luke chapter 19, Jesus is <clears throat> on his way to uh, Jerusalem. And he's going through Jericho. And we're going to talk about as he travels through Jericho. And then next Sunday we'll talk about when he got to Jerusalem. And look at all that occurred. And mainly that he gave his life for you and for me. And rose from the dead and did for you and for me. What you can for all eternity never do for yourself. What all of your goodness, all of your good works, all of my turning over a new leaf, all of my starting over again, all of my, okay, God, I messed up this time, but now I'm going to do better, which never happens. Jesus didn't come to fix me. He came to change me. I need more than just being fixed. I need to be changed from the inside out. And then that change will fix me. Amen. I want us to do a Bible study for just a little bit, verse by verse, over a man who saw his need for Jesus. And who Jesus saw in him, his need for Jesus, in Zacchaeus. And there's some things we can learn this morning from the life of Zacchaeus. Where Jesus took time, purposely, to stop and interject himself into Zacchaeus' life. So that he could change him from all, for all eternity. And guys, lost or saved this morning, what you and I desperately need is for Jesus to interject himself into your situation. Amen. And into my situation. And into my life. And into your life as a whole. You see, we have so many people today you're here, I'm here this morning for this very reason because we realize everything out there that is promised us in the world is a lie. Yeah. It cannot change you. It cannot fix you. It cannot help you. And any promises that Satan makes through the mouthpiece of the world, whether it be our government, whether it be Hollywood, whether it be sports figures, whether it be whatever it might be, philosophers, our, our uh, educational institutions, who whatever it might be that can promise you and I, this can help you, this can help you, this can bring you up, this can exalt you, this can do this and that. It's all promises that start out with a wow and end up with a woe. They're promises that are empty. They're promises that do not have the ability to bring a change in your life that is a change that is good, that gives your life substance, security, peace for all eternity. And those attributes are not found in anything that you can do outside of Jesus. He and He alone is the provider and the provision of everything that we're looking for out there. He is the answer. And He alone. Zacchaeus saw that. And Zacchaeus knew that. So, um, a few weeks back in our men's breakfast, uh, we did kind of a short devotional uh, about Zacchaeus and then mainly centered on a parable that Jesus told while at Zacchaeus' house in a few verses later. 
But this morning, I want to key in mainly just on Zacchaeus, and it's been on my heart ever since. All right, let's pray, and we'll get right to the Word. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to show yourself strong here this morning. We ask for your anointing, your power, your protection, and Father, that you would bring, Father, Holy Spirit, that you, Holy Spirit, would center our minds, our attention, and our heart on Jesus. And Father God, we ask you in the name of Jesus to seal Satan out of the equation this morning. And that you surround us with the Holy Spirit ring of fire. Just as you have about Israel. Behind, above, and in front. And Father, we ask you to put, Father, just a legion or however many of angels about us. And that Lord, if there is someone here this morning without Jesus. That today, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, but today they see their need for you and your love for them and that they would be saved. Father, we love you and we praise you in the mighty name of King, Lord, Almighty God, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. 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 All right. Look with me, if you would, in verse 1. Here we go. Now, I want to read this. There's, we're just going to read 10 verses. Then we're going to go back, and we're just going to verse by verse go through here. So here we go. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. How many remember the story of Joshua and the Valley of Jericho? Same city, rebuilt. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Now behold, there was an, a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was. But he could not because of the crowd. For he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Now, some versions may say mulberry tree. They were one in the same back then. <clears throat> to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today, I must stay at your house. So he made haste and he came down and received him Joyfully, say joyfully. Joyfully. But when they saw it, who is they? The naysayers, the religious. They all complained, saying, He, Jesus, has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Amen. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, now that's important, that's huge. Look, Lord, the name that he designated for Jesus. Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All right. Look back with me in verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. <clears throat> Jericho is a city of old from all the way back in the days of the giants. It was a city in the promised land in the book of Numbers. In chapter 13 and 14, where the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, went in to uh, the promised land, and the first city they came to was what? Jericho. And when they came to Jericho, you guys know how they 
marched around Jericho every day for seven days. And on the seventh day, they went around it. Somebody, how many times? Seven. Went around it seven times on the seventh day. And the walls came tumbling down. Okay? In Joshua chapter 6, the Bible says that Joshua, and I think it's verse 26, Joshua said, Cursed be anyone who rebuilds this city. Now, that's pretty strong. But here we see the city's been rebuilt. Now, God didn't rebuild it. Man rebuilt it. And that curse actually uh, was fulfilled. And I'm trying to think of the name of the guys, the two guys. The guy that built it, his two sons died while he was, uh, while he was building it. Anyway, the point is this. Jesus comes into a city that has been cursed. It has been rebuilt. And in the midst of this city, in the midst of this situation, Jesus walked into where there was curses, where there was uh, 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 what is it? destruction, much like situations that people without Jesus find themselves in today. And that's where Zacchaeus was living. That's where Zacchaeus was dwelling. That's where Zacchaeus was finding his home. That's where Zacchaeus had put down roots. And so Jesus, he walks in the midst of this situation. He's passing through, not by accident. Now this reminds me of the book of John, chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the woman at the well? And she's up there at the well on the top of the hill in the middle of the day because she had a bad name among the community. Y'all know what I'm talking about? She was known as, oh, she's one of them. Hello. Oh, she's one of them. Yeah, yeah. And so because people had distanced themselves from her, it's like mean girls to the 10th power. Because they had distanced themselves from her, she now has to go in the middle of the day when the women usually get water at the cool of the morning or the very cool of the evening. She comes in the heat of the day the most unlikely time because she knows that none of the other mean girls will be up there Telling her she's all this and she's all that. Are y'all tracking with me? I love this phrase. But God. But Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is on his way to Galilee. Okay? He's leaving Judah. He's on his way to Galilee. But verse Four says he must needs, he needed to go through Samaria. Now let me tell you why that's important. Because the Jews hated, loathed, could not stand the Samaritans. Because the Samaritans were half Gentile, half Jew, and they despised them. They were despicable. The so what they would do when they left Judah, Jerusalem, and were going to Galilee, they would go around on foot and with donkeys many, many miles out of the way just to not be in the same area as those people they despise. But Jesus went because Sychar here, the city in John chapter 4 that this woman is at, is almost in the center of Samaria. 
And so Jesus goes, now you've got to catch this, right through the center of what everybody else religious is avoiding. Do y'all hear me? I don't know about you, but how many of you have ever been in a religious church and you're like, ooh, I don't fit in here. And you can tell when you walked in the door. Listen, religion without relationship does not have God involved in it anyway. Amen. Jesus is what makes the church the church. Amen. Now watch this. So Jesus goes right through the middle of Samaria to Sychar. His timing is impeccable. Only God can time this out. And we're not going to preach on this young lady today, but this is imperative to see because the same principle is applied with Zacchaeus. You see, before the woman at the well ever thought about Jesus, Jesus had already been thinking about her. And before she had ever seen Jesus, knew about Jesus, or had heard Jesus, Jesus saw her, thought about her, knew her, and loved her. Amen. While she was being despised by the religious and despised by the mean girls, she was being loved by Jesus before she ever even knew him. And that love for Jesus, for this, quote, woman of ill repute, that love of Jesus for this woman caused Jesus to say, I must needs go right through Samaria. His disciples didn't get it. Other people didn't get it. But how many of you know God does not need my approval before God can move in my life? Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. There's sometimes God just does a sovereign move. He'll do a sovereign move in spite of what I'm thinking, in spite of what I'm doing, in spite of where I think God ought to do, in spite of what I expect God should do, and in spite of what I expect God is going to do. God will surprise me with His sovereignty and say, I believe I will take the steering wheel and motivate and do this. Amen. Or do that. And thank God at the end of that, am I glad that He did. Amen. Now that, that transition might be a little painful for me. It, there's not be things I may not, I might not understand in the midst of it, but God is always for my best. Amen. And so God, He doesn't listen to the disciples. He doesn't go by the common denominating opinion. He goes straight to the well on the top of the hill in the middle of the day. Sends his disciples to town. And the lady comes up by herself. Broken. Hurting. Dejected. Rejected. And alone. And all the other adjectives and adverbs that you can throw into the description of her life, she's feeling this. So she takes her bucket going to get what she thinks will help her for a few hours in one day, physical water. Not knowing that Jesus is fixing to offer her and give her the opportunity to make a choice for him that will fill her for eternity. Amen. Let me just throw this in here. It doesn't matter where you're at today. The Holy Spirit in the midst of your mess or your dejection, or your rejection, or you don't even understand yourself. Is trying to enter your circumstance and say, you need me. Amen. Now watch this. And I want you. You see, God doesn't need me. God wants me. Amen. Now watch this. 
That woman needed Jesus. But Jesus wanted her. Listen, Almighty God is totally self-sufficient. He is self-sustaining. He doesn't have to have anybody to do anything for Him. Every word He says and every action He does is purely grace and mercy and it's out of love. But He desires you and He desires your life because He's the only one that can truly satisfy and give you life. Amen? Amen. So Jesus went through Samaria. And the good part of the story, and I'll bring that part to a close, she got saved, born again, went to the town, told everybody, and all of a sudden, all the men of the town ran out to Jesus. And when the men of the town ran out to Jesus, they then talked to Jesus. The Bible says they believed. And then they said, we not, we now don't believe because of what you said. We believe because we heard his words ourselves. So Jesus comes to Jericho. And in coming to Jericho, he meets a man. And it says there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now skip on down, if you would, to uh, the latter part of verse 3. It, he says, but he was short. He was of a short stature. Let me bring something out that's easy to read, to read over, to read past and not get. It's very, very important for us today, for our personal life. In Jesus. The Bible says he was a very short man. People are like, well, what does that have to do with it? He was also a chief tax collector. And he was rich. He got rich by being a chief tax collector. Now watch. He had little man syndrome. And the reason he had little man syndrome, now I'm taking a moment to speculate on my behalf, amen. He had little man syndrome, and the reason I say he had little man syndrome is because he took a job, other than being a Roman guard or soldier, he took a job with the most authority that he could possibly have. Now watch this. And the job that he took, he viewed as an equalizer. Are y'all hearing me? He took that job and viewed it as an equalizer. I might be short, but I get your money, you're going to listen to me. Amen? Now watch this. He viewed this job as something that would make him bigger, not really in his own eyes, as in everybody else's eyes. Something that would make him important. Something that would make him have authority. Something that would make people respect him. They might hate him, but they'd respect him. Are y'all with me? Chief tax collector. Tax collector. Now watch this. This is what he thought might help him and equalize him in the world and culture that he lived. Now let me ask you a question. Are you involved in trying to do something, trying to make yourself into something, some some deal that makes you, and it, it serves as an equalizer. In other words, why are you and I doing what we're doing? Why do you do, why was he doing what he was doing? Now listen to this. When what you're doing causes you to think, boy, they'll see me now. 
That's an equalizer. When what you're doing causes me to think, I bet they'll respect me now. That's an equalizer. When what we're doing says, boy, I bet they'll like me now. That's an equalizer. That's where Zacchaeus was at. Zacchaeus was trying to earn the respect of man. He was trying to earn the, uh, the attention of man. He was trying to earn the authority of man by doing and performing things that he thought would, would bring that fulfillment only to find out, and we see this in this verse as well, in the next verse, only to find out he's still empty. He still has a vacuum. He still has a void in his life. He still has an empty spot. Then nothing can equalize. No matter what he looks like in man's eyes or other people's eyes. Nothing will fulfill that void. And so Jesus, he, he recognizes in Jesus what he does not have. And so the Bible says in verse 4, he runs ahead and he climbs up in the sycamore tree to see Jesus. For he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, saw him, and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must stay at your house. Today I must stay at your house. Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe it is, Jesus says, or Paul, Jesus through Paul says, for now is the accepted time of salvation. For today is the day of salvation. You've heard the old saying, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Well, that is eternally applicable in this sense. Zacchaeus knew here is an opportunity before me that has come to me through Jesus that I cannot miss. Now watch this. And you can see in his actions because he ran to climb a tree that he saw in Jesus what he knew no cultural status would ever get him. What he knew no no name he could make for himself in that city could ever procure this for him. He saw in Jesus what really would truly fill that emptiness in his life. Where he looked to get importance by getting a job that would give him authority or by getting a position that would get him respect or by getting, by getting no variety that even if they, he was hated, at least he would be known. You've seen people that desperate in criminals, for instance. They may not like me, but at least I'll be famous. Everybody hated him. Why? He's a tax collector. But as long as his name got spread through the city and he was infamously, infamously famous, at least somebody notices him. Because Satan has been telling him all along, you're too short. You're too this. You're too that. And then offers him all of these other alternatives on how to change it. Are y'all tracking with me? But he sees Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, the Holy Spirit immediately prompts his heart. And he has a drawing to Jesus. And he runs and he climbs a tree in order to see Jesus. Now that's just one alphabetical letter short of seeking Jesus. To seek Jesus. 
And for the sake of time, we won't turn there. But in Jeremiah chapter 29, in verse 11 through 15, the Lord tells us that if we will seek him with all of our heart, he says this, I will be found by you. Now watch. He runs and he climbs up that tree because he now has hope that things are about to change. Things are about to change. Guys, do you know why we come to church? One of the reasons, there's many, but one of the reasons we come to church because we want to be amongst like-minded people who truly believe the Word of God and believe that only in Jesus can He really bring about the change that we want and desire. Sometimes that change can be like a surgery that's being done on us. Sometimes that that change that Jesus brings can be painful at the beginning because there's things that we've grown up with in our whole our whole life that are absolutely destroying us, but we like them. And so sometimes those changes may not be the easiest thing, but they're always the best thing. Amen. And Zacchaeus had been lied to just like we have by the devil. They're never going to like you. They're never going to want you. You're too this and you're too that or you're too this or you're that or you're not this or you're not that. Just like the woman at the well. There's no telling what the quote mean girls have told her. Because human nature is no different now than it was then. And so Zacchaeus runs and climbs a tree because it was Jesus that he was wanting to see. And so Jesus tells him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down out of the tree for today, this day. Zacchaeus, I'm not going to wait and change you tomorrow. Zacchaeus, I'm not going to wait and say, well, you go through this ritual and this ritual and this ritual and this ritual and you clean up your life and you get started on this uh, this uh, systematic way of change and go through these 12 steps right here and then do this and then by the end you'll be ready for me to move into your life. He's like, no, Zacchaeus, I come to your house today because I want to enter the midst of your dirt, your mess, and all of your craziness and I want to change you today. Now listen to me. Not when you get home after church. Not when next Sunday rolls around. But today. The, and Zacchaeus, Jesus is telling Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, I'm not trying to talk to the Zacchaeus that you're trying to be. I'm not trying to talk to the Zacchaeus that you want to be. I'm not trying to talk to the Zacchaeus that you're trying to get everybody else to think you are. I'm talking to the Zacchaeus that I know you are. And that Zacchaeus, the real Zacchaeus, the Zacchaeus that needs to be transparent with me, that's the Zacchaeus I'm trying to reach this morning. And so Zacchaeus runs, the Bible says, home. He got down out of the tree. He followed the instructions of Jesus. Just by hearing the voice of Jesus, he made haste, he came down, he received him joyfully. Verse 7. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is going to be the guest with a man who is a sinner. How can Jesus be holy God, the Son of God, and go eat with sinners? Because Jesus says, look on down in verse 10. Verse, uh, 10. Here's why. Because the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That's why. That's why. Now look, we'll finish up here. So he made haste, he came down, he received him joyfully. The religious, the naysayers, his fellow tax collectors, all of that, 
He's gone to be a guest with a man who's the sinner. Verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. Now this is awesome to me. They're in the house. He's got all these other sinners gathered around for dinner. Remember the Pharisees said Jesus eats with prostitutes and tax collectors and the dark and the lowly and all this stuff. Listen. He didn't eat to be like them. He ate with them so he could change them. Amen. He did not eat and meet with them to enable them. He, eat, he ate and met with them to bring them out of where they're at because they can't get out themselves. He came to bring them out of captivity and the only way he could get them out of captivity he is the one that holds the key to the jail cell they're in. Amen. And the key is himself. They can't get themselves out. Zacchaeus has tried, tried. The woman at the well has tried and tried. And she's also allowed all these other voices to tell her. And she's believed them and has accepted that's who she is. Zacchaeus has accepted what the devil has been telling him. That's who I am. I'm short. Nobody likes me. I'm a Jew in a, in a town that's been cursed among all of these Gentiles. I'm collecting their taxes. They don't like me. They don't want me. Most of them want to kill me. And Jesus enters the scene. Guys, it is no different with me and you. Jesus is asking you this morning, can I come into your house? This body, 1 Corinthians 6 says, is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's a house, so to speak. Paul actually, 2 Corinthians 5, calls it a tent. You're like, why would he call it a tent? Because a tent is a temporary dwelling. You're only going to have this body so long. And it's going to be gone. But Jesus is saying, can I come in and change, bring change, himself bring change to your life? And Jesus would say, will say, is saying, and would say this. I'm the only one that can do it. I'm the only one that can set you free, he says about himself. And I am the only one who can truly fill that vacuum that you feel in your life. Jesus said, I'm in. Let me share something with you real quick. Look at verse uh, 7. Then Zacchaeus stood and said in front of everybody, Look, Lord. He doesn't call him Jesus. He doesn't call him Master. He doesn't call him Teacher. He calls him Lord. In other words, you are God in the flesh. You are Lord. And then you see the fruits of repentance. I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anybody by false accusation, I restore it uh, fourfold. Now, According to the law in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, God said that if you had stolen something by falsities, by deceit, or by robbery, when you, when you uh, repent, that you have to restore all that you took plus one-fifth. So he says, I'll restore it fourfold. That's way more than what God is requiring. In the law. Why? Because now Jesus has changed his heart. And has given him a heart to give. A heart to restore. A heart to see restitution done. To those who he has hurt. And so verse 9. Jesus says. Today. There's that word again. Salvation has come to this house. Because he also is the son of Abraham. 
He was a son of Abraham only by physical lineage. Now he is a son of Abraham in the sense of Luke chapter 16, Father Abraham, in a spiritual sense, he is a child of the living God. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Guys, let me tell you all. I don't know where you're at with Jesus today. I'm assuming probably most folks here have given their heart and life to Jesus. But also, I know as many people as are here, there may be some of you who have not given your heart and life to Jesus. And listen, I say this because this happens so much. Going to church for five Sundays don't make me a Christian, amen? amen? Going to church my whole life don't make me a Christian. Amen. Guys, it's knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus. No, be religious won't change you. It won't change me. I've said this before, and you can share this with other people too. Being in church doesn't make me any more a Christian than standing in my garage makes me a car. It's not going to happen. And you can use that with other people to explain. Guys, I don't get saved by osmosis by standing next to Calvin and Calvin's salvation rubbing off on me. Now having said that, because my mama's saved don't make me saved. Amen. Because my grandma's saved don't make me saved. Are y'all hearing me? Because I've read through the Bible, don't make me saved. Now that's a great thing. And God will reach you through reading the Bible. And you and I should be reading the Bible. But reading the Bible in and of itself, apart from Jesus, will not save you. Only Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and Jesus alone can give you life. And here's what I'm saying. And that change in your heart and in your walk and in your actions and in your attitudes, because my actions are only the result of my attitude and my thought life, amen? So God comes in and changes how I think. If I let him. So Jesus, who is for you and everything he's ever done, is a love action, and this is a love letter to say to you, sir, ma'am, young person, old people, I love you. And if you will let me in your heart and life, I will give you the life that you've been wanting forever and ever. If you will just come to me. And I'm finished by just saying this. In, in John chapter 6, Jesus, the Pharisees, came to Jesus. And Jesus told them, they were very, very religious. He said, but you won't come to me that you might have one. And guys, so many people, they want what Jesus has, but in deception, they don't want to let go of repentance. <laughs> repentance. They don't want to let go of their life that is opposite and opposing Jesus. But it's like we said in Sunday school this morning, many people want, want the gifts of Jesus without Jesus. And they want the help of Jesus without Jesus. And they want eternal life but without Jesus. And they want the miracles and blessings of God but without God. God, I want you to heal me, fix me, change me, do all this. But I'm, I, can, I, can, I can make my own way. Really? And how does that work for you so far? I'm a 
living testimony. It don't. Amen? Amen. All right, let's see. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody warm in here other than me? Thank you. I'll help you out. <laughs> um, listen, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know something. We love you. But what really matters is Jesus loves you. He truly, truly does. It's not just a sign on the billboard. It's not just a, how do you say it, a macrame that somebody stitched into a, a neat shirt. It's none of these things. He truly, really, really does love you. And listen, you're here today because He really does want you and He's trying to draw you to Himself. But he will not force himself into your life. He will allow you to make that choice. So if you're here today and you'd say, Preacher, I'm going to be honest today with myself, with God, with myself. Maybe for the first time. I need Jesus. I'm lost. I'm not proud of that. I'm just being honest. I'm lost. I need Jesus. I've never accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I've never asked Him to do in me what He did for me on the cross. I need Jesus. If that's you, I want to challenge you. Everybody's looking. Everybody's looking. I'm looking. Everybody's looking. Just like when Zacchaeus stood up in the middle of his house. Lord, I repent in the name of Jesus. Everybody's looking. Listen. If you can't stand for Jesus in here among people that love you, you'll never stand for Him out there. Amen. Never. And besides that, when you step out for Jesus in here, it gives you a one-up lift to step out and stand for Him out there. Amen. Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father. Whoever denies me before me and him will I deny before my father and the angels who are in him. So, here's my point. It's important to God to make a decision without shame and embarrassment to say, I choose Jesus. Amen? Amen. He's worth standing up and standing out for. He's worthy of it. So, if you need to be saved, I'm going to ask you if you just come up here with me. I'm going to stand here with you. And you can take somebody's hand next to you and bring them with you if you want to. And just say, hey, would you walk up there with me? That's, that's cool too. Anybody? I know I know that might be different. That might be sound hard. Guys, it's a truth. It's a truth. And listen, I want to tell you, it does not, a blind person can see, our, we're in a mess. Our world and our nation, every, it, we're in a mess. Jesus is coming soon. I'm just telling you. He is coming soon. So, I'm not going to tarry. And I'm not going to beg anybody. But we don't want to do that. I don't want to talk you into getting saved. You won't get saved. That ain't real. But if you truly need Jesus, would you just come? And we're going to pray for thoroughly in two. Um, would you just come? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. You're coming to rededicate your life as well. Amen. Don't want to be lukewarm anymore. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm with you. Hallelujah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Also, and thank you, sis. Uh, God is good. Uh, can I tell them what's going on real quick? Uh, okay. She was diagnosed with cancer. This week, uh, with lung cancer, and so she has come up for us to anoint her with oil and pray over her. Amen. And we know that God heals. Uh, that's not my opinion. The Word of God says so. 
Many of you have been healed before by the touch of Jesus. So we're going to pray over her and believe God to heal her. Amen. And then, um, go ahead. Amen. So, and let me tell you about, we're going to baptize Spencer today. Amen. And, uh, hallelujah. Uh, we talked over the phone, and also Jasmine. Where's Jasmine at? She's already back there. That, that girl ain't slow. Um, so she's excited. We're excited for her also. Um, Spencer and I have been visiting this week quite a bit. And, um, man, he has given his heart, his life. And I want to throw this in. With no strings attached. Jesus, I'm all yours. Yeah. Whatever happens, I'm yours. Wherever you take me, I'm yours. And he's asked Jesus to come in and be Lord, not just Savior. Are y'all hearing me? But Lord God Almighty over his life and in his life. And guys, <laughs> let me tell you. Listen, now I'm not going to preach. God will never be second place in your life. Do you hear me? I don't care what you try to do to make him that way. God is God and he will not settle for second place. He will not. And if you think he will, you're fooling yourself. He will not take second place. He will not sit in the back seat and try to tell you how to drive from the front. It is not going to happen. So, we got to be real, amen? we got to be real. we got to be real. So, my point being, uh, man, we pray, and Spencer himself, and I'm just going to tell you, Spencer himself said, Crying out to Jesus. Tears are flowing. Tears don't save you, but they're awesome. Amen. It's just the relief. And um, crying out to Jesus. Jesus, be... And he was hollering on the phone. I'm just going to tell you. And it's awesome. Jesus, be... I ask you to be Lord of my life. And this was his words. And be Lord of every nook and cranny of my heart. Amen. That's serious. Amen. That's serious. That's like... I need Jesus serious. Amen? Amen? So we're going to baptize him this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So, uh, brother, go ahead and make your way back. If you would, you got your clothes with you. Did you want to say anything? Okay. I don't blame you. I talk enough for all this. All right. Guys, let's pray over at their men. And listen. I know everybody's got something to do, but God's worth being patient for. Amen. Patient with. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So, if some of you or whoever feels like the Holy Spirit is leading you to, if you will come up and we're going to lay hands on...